I'm going to do two things in the final podcast for this unit. First, I'm going to go over some of the things that your book says about making oral presentations or special kinds of speeches that are designed to persuade or to inform an audience, uh, something that we do a lot in business and in the corporate world. Second, I'm going to give you an example of a classroom presentation from an actual college class of four students who have banded together to do one of these oral presentations, much like the assignment that I've given you for this unit. And at the end of that example, I'm going to give you some key questions that I want you to work with as you go to the bulletin board for this week's post. Okay, let's first talk about the three purposes of oral presentations, or, or more or less the three kinds of oral presentations that you'll be called upon to give. Remember our Pybach method, purpose is the first thing that you want to think of before you design any kind of communication. And the three purposes that the book talks about are informative presentations, or presentations that are designed to inform or teach the audience something. These are the kinds of presentations you will do probably within the company that you work for. If, as you're demonstrating something to perhaps your supervisors or the sales manager or the marketing director, you will unveil what you've done and you'll inform them about it. Persuasive presentations, presentations designed to motivate the audience to act, these are sales presentations. This is what you do regularly in the corporate world when you try to convince people to buy your stuff. And finally, goodwill presentations. These are public relations type things. This is what you give when you go to the Lions Club, when you, when you speak at a commencement or a graduation, when you speak at church groups. You're trying to entertain the audience, tell them a lot of funny stories, validate them, make them perceive you and the organization that you work for as people that they want to work with, people that they can feel good about making part of their lives. Your book also identifies three basic strategies for making oral presentations, all of which can be used for a variety of different kinds of presentations. The monologue is the standard speech type presentation where you or your group stand up and address the audience and the audience doesn't say anything until perhaps a question and answer session at the end. The guided presentation or the guided discussion occurs when, when you or whoever's doing the presenting stands up and immediately involves the audience, asks questions, directs discussion, pulls things out of the audience. This is what you often do in training sessions where you're teaching people. It's what classroom teachers do. Most classroom discussions that aren't on podcasts are guided presentations where a professor who knows quite a bit, hopefully, leads the students through a variety of questions and tries to arrive at certain conclusions. Then the sales presentation, and this is not just for selling stuff, it's for selling ideas, it's for selling concepts, it's for persuading people. This is where you bring in a presentation and you, you give the presentation, but not as a monologue, as a dialogue with the person or the people that you're trying to persuade to buy something or to do something, and may very often be answering questions and resolving concerns. And you, you can't do a monologue in these kinds of presentations because you've got to be able to adopt uh, I'm sorry, to adapt on the fly to the concerns that people might have. This one just keeps getting more and more important, making visuals. It used to be that when people gave a presentation, they would occasionally have either an easel with a drawing once or twice that they pointed to during the presentation, or maybe a map, or even something that they just held up and said, well, look at this. Now we give presentations with PowerPoint or with Keynote. We give presentations with presentation software that puts visuals and text and sounds and movies up on the screen that we can use as part of our presentation. And this is a wonderful addition. It, it can make the presentation much more valuable. But it's possible to be just as boring with a PowerPoint as you ever were before there was PowerPoint possible to use visuals badly or just to have them there for no particular reason. 
So use visuals, but think carefully about the visual information that you're going to include. Don't just throw the text that you're going to say and read it off of the screen. That's kind of dumb. Try to make each visual a single point. So every time you go from one point to the next, uh, use a new visual and don't try to use one visual that has several different concepts in it. That will just create confusing pictures. Try to limit information to 35 words. This is a suggestion that your book has, and usually it's a pretty good suggestion. Though there are longer quotations you may want to throw up on the board as quotations to discuss that are going to go beyond 35 words. And finally, don't put your visual up until you're ready to talk about it. This is pretty good advice. Don't just have a visual up there the whole time because that will distract people from what you're saying. So put the PowerPoint slide or the projection or whatever you're going to put up on a screen or whatever you're going to use as a visual. Don't put it up there until you're going to be able to point to it or you'll just create distractions for your audience. Now we're ready for the student presentation. This is a filmed student presentation that came as part of a course pack for a public speaking textbook that I borrowed from Dr. Curtis Hain in our communication department. So this is nobody that I know or have ever met. It's nobody that I'm related to, so you don't have to feel any hesitation about criticizing uh, or saying positive things about these speakers. This is a team of four speakers who are giving a joint presentation on the use of antibacterial um, products to, to kill bacteria and the problems that this, this might cause. So each of the speakers will have a role. There's a moderator and there's three speakers. What I would like to do is to watch the, this presentation. It's about seven, seven and a half minutes. And then the very final slide will just contain some questions that I want you to go to the bulletin board and answer. And I will repeat these questions in the assignment portion of Blackboard. So you don't have to uh, look at them all at once and memorize them here. They will be available for you in a variety of different formats. A meticulously dressed man in a suit and overcoat squeezes his way through the rush hour crowd as he boards the New York City subway. Now as he braces himself for the ride ahead, he just happens to notice a sign above him that says, you are the 423rd person to touch that pole today. Yuck. Nearby another advertisement warns, the last guy to touch that pole was named Sal Manila. Just think of the hundreds of people that have sat in that very seat or touched that same spot in front of you. Ever stop to wonder how many of those people wash their hands in the bathroom before sitting there? Through our research, we have found that America's obsession with germs is being fueled by misleading advertising and overzealous use of antibacterial products. Americans' overuse of these products is reducing their effectiveness as germ fighters. Today, we're going to get down and dirty with germs. My name is Jenny. I will be your moderator. Megan will, be, will begin by identifying the abuse of these products and by describing the dangerous consequences. Daniel will propose a more practical solution for germ control, and Stephanie will visualize a future without limited use of antibacterial products. Most of us have heard of these products, and many of us use them and buy them. Megan will begin by telling us why these products are not as effective as we would like them to be. The November 10, 1997 edition of the New Republic states that half of all Americans buy antibacterial products whenever possible. As consumers, we should be concerned about antibacterial product overuse. Through my research, I have learned that antibacterial products lose their effectiveness if not used in moderation. Practical, not obsessive use of antibacterial products is essential for total germ protection. Today, I will discuss our overuse of antibacterial products. I will point out misleading advertising that gives us a false sense of security. And finally, I will warn you of the dangerous consequences of antibacterial product overuse. Megan's depiction of our overuse is a serious problem. 
Daniel will now propose a more practical solution for germ control. So how can we help prevent the spread of resistant bacteria? We all have to be more responsible. Through my research, I've developed a plan of action that everyone can easily follow. There are several alternative solutions to germ removal. Today, we'll discuss some alternatives to antibacterial products. In particular, the solution can be found through the use of regular soap and by simply being more practical with antibacterial products. According to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, December 19, 2000, hand washing with regular soap is still the best way to prevent infection. Thank you, Daniel. Dr. Mark Makosi, chairman of the National Hygiene Foundation, supports and practices our solution for germ protection. Stephanie will now visualize a future without limited use of antibacterial products. It is a bleak winter season again, and everyone seems either ill or determined to spread his or her germs. The grocery store clerk sneezes as she scans the produce. The man on the train coughs constantly as his seatmate scrunches against the window trying to avoid getting sick. But there is a counterinsurgency out there, armed with an arsenal of hand soaps, lotions, sprays for the bathroom and kitchen, band-aids, toothbrushes, toothpaste, even chopsticks promising to kill household germs. The army is deployed despite scientists' repeated warnings that more and more bacteria are becoming impervious to antibiotics. Studies are showing that at least in laboratories, bacteria are becoming resistant to the germ-killing chemicals in soaps and cleansers. This is a scary story for us to consider, being that we use antibacterial products every day, even if it is just to wash our hands in the public restroom. This New York Times article from January 7th of 2001 points out very important information for us to think about. Personally, I use antibacterial products every day and was surprised to find through my research that I could be harming myself and others. The continued abuse of antibacterial products presents a dangerous future for germ control. Today, we will examine the future without the res without continued use of antibacterial products. We will discuss the possibilities of resistant bacteria strains developing. Then we will discuss the mutation of bacteria that we eventually will be unable to defend against. Thank you, Stephanie. You can protect yourself against germs without the use of antibacterial products. The solution is simple. Wash your hands. Ironically, the America that cleans with antibacterial cleansers is unwilling to take such a simple step. According to the American Society of Microbiology, in a study of 7,836 people in restrooms in Chicago, Los Angeles, Atlanta, New Orleans, and San Francisco, only 58% washed their hands. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Maybe you are boarding the subway. Maybe you're just sitting in a classroom. You can still protect yourself against germs without the use of antibacterial products. Through our research, we found that America's obsession with germs can be handled effectively without the use of these products. We hope that we've convinced you that America's overuse is reducing these products' effectiveness. Today, Megan identified the abuse of antibacterial products and described the dangerous consequences. Daniel proposed a more practical solution for germ control, and Stephanie visualized a future without limited use of antibacterial products. So the next time you're on your subway or sitting in the classroom, remember you can protect yourself against germs without the use of antibacterial products. I think it